I'm Edie Lash and I'm here at the Hub Culture Pavilion in Davos. It's day four of the World Economic Forum. A lot of discussion about the economy. I'm very pleased to be joined by Junma Jaya Sinha. You're the, um, you're the chairman of Asia Pacific for Boston Consulting Group. Tell me, what are your thoughts on the economy now? I'm very happy that this year, firstly, the mood is better than the year before and the year before that. And now when I say that this is the best period in world history, people don't laugh me out of the room. Mm -hmm. And that is because, you know, if we go across the quarter, just go beyond the quarters and start looking at longer term trends, then we can see really that there is a global reset taking place in a fundamental way, which hasn't gotten as much attention as it should, mm -hmm. but is actually fundamentally going to change the world we live in. Do you think that that's... Well, tell me, first of all, about how about some of those, about those elements. So, firstly, you know, this is the most peaceful time in human history. Mm -hmm. Less people die of war, of civil war, of terrorism than ever before. But it, it, you wouldn't get that sense if you saw the news, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Real-term GDP per capita has grown from 5000 to almost $7,800. Mm -hmm. In the last 50 years more people have come out of poverty than the 500 years prior to that. And right now there are less people in poverty than ever before. Mm -hmm. Life expectancy for the world has gone up from 63 to 70 almost. And, you know, in, in 2010, 2.8 billion people used to consume $3.1 trillion. In 2020, 3.1 trillion people, these 2.8 uh, mm -hmm. will become 3.1 billion, <coughs> and they will consume 14.5 trillion. So that's an increase of 11 trillion dollars. Mm -hmm. And much of it is happening in my neck of the woods. Yep. And so after 200 years, you take long strands, 1800 to 1900, 1900 to 2000, and then from 2000 till about 2100, mm -hmm. the world's going to reset. And what's happening is actually it's becoming a fairer world. So in 1800, in 1820, actually China and India were 50% of the global economy. And in 2040, it'll again be the same. And this doesn't mean that anyone loses. Actually, the opportunities are much greater. Because just imagine, there is $15 trillion of incremental consumption which is coming about in Asia, which people have to serve. But they have to learn to serve it. It's hard and it's different. And people are complaining about the past, but they are not looking seriously into the future. Do you think we feel uh, what a good place we're in? I mean, certainly from sitting in London, it feels dismal. I mean, I imagine that we're, we're sitting, we're coming from very different places, but for a quality of life perspective, for example, people feel like they're much worse off than they were. So, you know, if I, if I divide it into three swathes, say, mm -hmm. the US, Europe, and the rest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And maybe I add a bit of Japan into the U Europe part, mm -hmm. right? Then you look at, it depends on what you're looking at. So I believe, unfortunately, and not so much England, but certainly France, a lot of Europe is becoming about preserving, mm -hmm. not about creating and destroying, you know. The U.S., I think, is a political problem. It's not really an economic problem. I mean, I used to think of cliffs, you know, where you look down at the sea, but now the cliff has got a bad name. It's a fiscal cliff. You mm -hmm. know? I mean, it's <laughs> never, never really, uh, yeah. the, you know, what you used to expect and anticipate. So I feel that the U.S. will solve it. I mean, you know, it's a vibrant kind of an economic mm -hmm. structure which will work itself out. Europe has some serious issues. It has opportunities, but they won't come easy. Mm -hmm. You know, there is all of North Africa. Europe has got bad demographics. There's North Africa from where there can be immigration. But if you have high social security, then the people who will want to go in there are the, not the, I mean, are going in for the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. The Indian immigrants going out from in India to uh, either to London or to Canada or to mm -hmm. the US were wanting to make a life and they have actually contributed to those uh, societies and those countries. Indians are the richest community in the US, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, and, and these were not rich people. They, mm -hmm. were, they were educated, poor and hungry people wanting to get a better life. So Europe has a bit of an issue, but I did, we did 16,000 interviews recently, you know, mm -hmm. for swathes of people who we would call the emerging middle class hmm? mm -hmm. or redefining 
to the world what actually middle class is. Mm -hmm. Because the middle class used to be this $40,000 to $70,000 household income in the U.S. That would have been more than the super rich in India. Actually, it's $7,000 to $20,000. And these people are coming in. And they want a better life now. And they are not much bothered about governments. They just want a better life now. And they really want the middle class dream, which is, you know, a house and some education. Healthcare will come a bit later. Right now, they just want those things. And they are striving hard to get it, and they are seeing an opportunity to get it because they are moving towards that. And this is going to be an engine, you know, and it's going to take us back to 1800s rather than 1900. Because if you look at, the, I mean, from post-World War II, every country in the world, every company in the world wanted one thing, the American consumer's wallet. Mm -hmm. That's it. Now we will go back to 1800 when the East India Company, the Dutch East India mm -hmm. Company wanted the Asian wallet. Right. But we'll have to rediscover Asia. <laughs> you know? And the wallet is there. It wants to spend, but you have to rediscover it. And that's a bit hard, but it's there and it will be a great opportunity. So actually the best is yet to come. I mean, I would, uh, yeah, so let me reset that a bit. It is firstly a better time than ever before, mm -hmm. but the best is yet to be. So when when are you predicting that we're going to see even better? So you know it's going to be an uh, it's going to be an accelerating trend. 2020 will be better than 2010. 2030 will be better than 2020. And I'm talking about seven billion people, not about mm -hmm. 700 million people. Right. And if we talk about seven billion people, the world is going to be better for the 700 million people if they are willing to explore, and if they are willing to reset and find that, okay, fine, you know, it's easier to sell in the U.S., but now we have to sell to this Indian who doesn't quite look right and doesn't mm -hmm. quite feel right, but actually has money and wants to buy. And then pe people will discover it. You know, people like to make money, and they will go where the money is. But it'll take a bit of time to reset, and just now we are overwhelmed by what I would say, and I say this humbly, by the fact that the global opinion is still formed by the Economist, the Financial Times, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the B CNN, the BBC. But you know, they need to, the Economist gives two pages to China, six pages to Britain, and every so often, yeah. half a page to India. Right. I don't know. This doesn't sound right <laughs> to me. <laughs> We'll leave it there. Thank you so much for coming by the Hub Culture Pavilion. Absolutely fascinating. And I'm Edie Lush. Thank you so much.